So we're going through the Cenozoic today. And so a lot of times when people uh, take classes, if you get to take a class on vertebrate paleontology or the history of life or whatever, when you get to the age of mammals, when you get to the Cenozoic, I think most people launch really quickly into talking about some of the animals you guys are seeing on this slide and some of the things we'll talk about today. All the really fun and amazing mammalian megafauna that existed in the Cenozoic. These are great organisms because they are in a lot of ways familiar to you. A lot of them are close relatives of things that are alive today. And then there's also the really odd ones that don't really look like anything alive today, but they're not dinosaurs. They don't have that kind of Godzilla monster thing going on. They are animals that you think you could imagine walking around in a zoo or something like that. And I really like designing the course the way I teach it so that we talk about the radiation from the Paley gene, we talk about the oceans, and we talk about all the crazy stuff in Africa and South America, because otherwise I don't feel like there's a good space for those things if we go with this. But this is the really, really, really dominant story of setting up the world, I think, this has been true increasingly as we move through this course, like the world you guys live in. And so I call this lecture grasses and hooves because a grassland biome, we're gonna talk a lot about grass today, the plant grass, um, is a relatively new one on this planet and it's a dominant one. You guys have seen on our climate charts that like, as we get closer to the recent earth is getting cooler. I can tell you it's also on average getting drier across the different landscapes and grasslands are an ecosystem doesn't mean grasses evolved for the first time. It means grasslands as an ecosystem spread all over the world and tons of animals, you've seen some of the South American and Australian and African ones, adapt to those grasslands once they arrive on those continents. And there's a bunch of just really beautiful vertebrate evolutionary patterns we can talk about that are associated with grasslands. And so for today, that's where I wanted to start off. On the continents of our planet, more than a third are these type of habitats. They could be semi-arid, almost desert-like, they could be relatively lush, but grasslands are a huge part of the land of this planet. Now, we humans have replaced most natural grasslands with farming because they fertile soil, we can irrigate it and grow our crops and our food. So in fact, this might seem like a huge number to you, but you have to imagine all the prairies that are now Nebraska and Iowa, all the parts that are now Ukraine, all these parts in Southern South America, are actually now all where we do all our agriculture. But these grasslands are what were there for many millions of years. And so this habitat is a pretty intense environment in a lot of ways. And so I wanted you guys to take a few minutes talking to your neighbors about, if you're gonna be an organism that's adapted, and let's worry about maybe the animals that might be eating grass in the first place, this new habitat starts spreading all over the planet. Every, different continents have different organisms that can maybe adapt to be animals that live in this habitat. What kind of adaptations are you going to expect to see in these organisms? Okay, so go ahead and talk to Eric about this. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like a desert necessarily. I'm just not on the plates and stuff. I think so. I mean, yeah, so all right so what kind of things are you guys talking about 
these open, drier habitats. First thing we talked about was the need to travel long distances or move quickly as well. Uh, okay, so like locomotor adaptations. Like open habitats, so like different locomotor adaptations, maybe to go quickly, maybe to go far. Maybe, mm -hmm. Hannah, what were you going to say? Okay, so uh, we can think of it as like maybe things that are like, there's a lot, of, uh, this is more of a factor, there's like a lack of cover, so like well, how do you deal with that? So one thing could be like a camouflage, nature is a thing. There's, uh, okay. No, go ahead, go, go. What, what's hers? Animals like in packs so that you have more protection in numbers. Okay. Not so that's maybe behavioral. Right? Uh, if you have 40 people with you and then something attacks, it's less likely than if you're like by yourself. That's something that's really interesting. You guys can think about this. Like, uh, there's animals that are jungle adapted today that have cousins that are grassland adapted, and often the ones in the forest are relatively solitary or small groups, whereas the ones in the open are like in groups of hundreds or thousands very often. That's an interesting behavioral thing. What else? I'm, yes, sir. So grass is not an easy plant. Okay. So <laughs> and maybe like strong feet. Okay. So different kinds of ways to like process a pretty tough plant. You guys might not know if the grass is tough or not. That might be a surprise to you. You don't have to know. But sure. So processing a pretty tough plant, that's that's really if you're out there eating the grasses, I would bet. What was happening over here? Oh yeah. So um I was saying that uh these these types of biomes is uh they typically have, you know, is it's not a very mild climate. So during mm. the summer you have very hot summers and then very cold, uh very cold cold winter uh, so uh you need a so you need like a a seasonal coat maybe okay so uh, so so uh you need to have a tolerance you need to have a uh, ability to live in different right. habitats or you do what a lot of animals do which is move around on habitats like this there's a lot of migration that happens right so in the tropics you might not be too worried about it ever getting cold but you might have extreme changes in wet and dry things like the serengeti today or that's how that changes it's never going to be too cold for the wildebeest and the zebra, but it might be very, very dry versus very, very wet at different times of the year. Up here where we live, the grasslands in North America and up into Canada from the U.S., yeah, you're going to have like really freezing, freezing winters and really, really hot summers in the same place. And so different kind of adaptations to that. These are good ideas. I like that you guys are thinking about. I like that you're thinking about behavioral things too, like the herding adaptations. What I want you to remember is that we saw in the Eocene so many of the best fossil uh, inferences we can make from uh, what we find. So many of the data, so much of the data we get from climatology tells us about a very wet, very warm world in most of the Paleocene and the Eocene. All these mammals are diversifying in these forests, and so what's interesting is how animals then adapt to these grasslands. And you guys have given us a few things here to think about as we move into talking about grasslands. Um, it's already I kind of asked you this. Um, you talked about diet a little bit, and then other selective factors, you kind of already got there with talking about things like herding or being able to locomote over this really open space. That's really interesting stuff. So let's talk about teeth. Mammals, as I told you guys before, we talked about it in the Mesozoic for a hot second, are really, really, really known by their teeth. It's a little bit of a joke, but it's not that unserious. Back in the early uh, 1800s and the late 1700s, when like modern zoology was really coming into being, the guy who ran the museum in Paris, like Cuvier, he actually said, if you show me a mammal tooth, I will draw you the rest of the animal because you can learn so much from a mammal tooth. And so you guys are somewhat familiar with some of this on this diagram. So tooth has an enamel outer layer that's crystalline. Once it rots, it's gone. It doesn't regrow. That's why you have to protect yourself from cavities. Your dentin is soft, a lot like bone. There's some other tissues in there. Your tooth has a root and a crown. But in mammals, there's so many descriptive words that end in dont. Dont, of course, means tooth. You humans have brachyodont teeth, which means you have short teeth. Your crown and your roots are pretty close to the same size relative to each other. You have a low crowned tooth, and that shows what you can eat. A horse has a hypsodont tooth. A lot of the same architecture, but the crown is way, 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 way higher. And then the horse has a different series of enamel ridges mixed in with the dentine and even other tissues that wear down. A horse is eating a grassy diet, that tooth is getting worn down. It is going away. But because it's such a huge tooth, it'll last that horse most of its lifetime. 
So that's a very intense adaptation potentially to eating a really tough plant is being hypsodon. There's what a horse's face looks like if you pull back the bones. Those teeth are always erupting throughout the horse's life. So an old horse will have really shallow roots because that tooth will mostly have been ground down. It's very, very, very cool. If you work in like animal husbandry, these types of animals, you need to actually care for their teeth because if they're not getting a high, high, brutal enough diet, their teeth are going to grow too fast. You have to wear them down, which is really excellent. That's a very intense adaptation to your diet. It's not the most extreme though. There are many rodents. You guys know this already. We talked about it just a little bit. Rodents are famous for their ever-growing incisors, those teeth in the front of the mouth that had an enamel on the outside, dentine on the inside. These are ever-growing. Rabbits also have ever-growing incisors, but there are a handful of rodent taxa, not all. This is a mouse up here. A mouse has the ever-growing incisor, but then in its cheek teeth, its molar teeth are kind of a lot like yours because a mouse has a very diet, eats little fruits, sometimes it eats bugs and stuff. This is a guinea pig manful. A guinea pig has what we call hip cellodont teeth, even more extreme than a horse. There's rodents out there, gophers or another lineage, that they don't even have a root on their cheek teeth. The tooth is forever, ever growing. New tissues being deposited deep in the jaw and it's still erupting. So that horse is gonna run out eventually. These little animals never run out. That's called hip cellodonty. And another really extreme adaptation to eating grass. So you guys are talking about camouflage, you're talking about getting around out there. You probably were thinking of animals like horses and wildebeest when I asked you the question, but there's a lot of other adaptations of whole clades of vertebrates that have adapted to grasslands and they do it in a really, really different way. They're still eating the same plant material, so they have really interesting similar adaptations, but obviously gophers aren't doing the same locomoting and herding. You guys probably think of things that they are doing, which is really fun. So it's cool to look at the different kinds of adaptations different vertebrates are making to this pretty extreme habitat. And so Stuart said this, some of you guys might know this already, grass is a real nightmare. It's terrible nutrition-wise. If you were to go around and just eat grass, it would not work out for you. You don't have the adaptations to do it. Not only would you very quickly, in the scale of your lifespan, ruin your teeth, your gut really can't digest it. Almost all the animals that are obligate grass eaters have a really advanced microbiome, a co-evolved set of mostly bacteria in their guts that help them get nutrients from this like extremely indigestible plant because of cellulose everywhere. There's just not that much nutrients per bite in a piece of grass. On top of all that, between grass cell walls, there are pieces of silicon. Grasses have evolved that as a defense so that it like ruined your teeth to eat grass and then the animals get more intense teeth and then the grass put more silica into their leaves. It's very awesome. When you guys like play with grass, maybe this summer you could do it, you might like get a little cut on your finger. That's the silica that's in there. It's meant to hurt you because the grass doesn't want to get eaten. That's extremely cool. And so one thing you can do is chew. We'll probably talk a lot about chewing. Process that food a whole lot, help that bacteria out by destroying as many of those bonds as you can, destroying as many of those cell walls as you can. Animals like this are ruminants. They swallow, it goes down into their stomach. You guys probably know things like cows have a four chambered stomach. You maybe have heard that before. Only one of them, this one, is homologous with the thing you have that you call a stomach. But then they've got one chamber after that and two chambers before that. The one that's before that is called the rumen, and only some of these even-toed animals have this. They digest some food, I mean, they swallow some food, it gets uh, worked on by bacteria, and then they spit some of it back up, up into the mouth. That's called chewing the cud. They regurgitate the grass and chew it some more, swallow it again. Regurgitate it, chew it some more, swallow it again. So this is obviously very interesting. This is very time intensive, but the food that you're eating is like extremely easy to get. You don't really have to hunt or forage. You just go like this and your food is in your face. So it's interesting to imagine how these things worked. This is obviously extreme. We don't have good evidence of this in the fossil record, as you probably imagine. Soft tissue is hard to infer from fossils, but we can use the living members to get after it. The point is teeth adaptations, stomach adaptations, there's a lot of ways to become a grass eater and a lot of animals do it very different ways. So I wanna talk about that. Here's two animals today. This one, not as intensely as that one, but two animals today that definitely do eat grass. They have different ways of fermenting food in their gut. This animal has four gut fermentation, meaning that chamber where the, the bacteria does a lot of its work is before the actual stomach that's homologous with your stomach and the other mammal's stomachs. So it's four gut. 
Whereas this animal has hind gut. There's a big chamber behind what you'd call the stomach where a lot of this fermentation happens of the plant material. So different structures. They also have different teeth. Here's two more tooth words. A lot of these animals like deer have what we call selenodont teeth. Seleno is the moon. They have a cusp that looks like a little half moon on their molar teeth. Very intense ridges, also of enamel and dentine for processing plants. And then horses and rhinos have these things called lophodont molars. There's a lot of crests on their teeth. Different architecture than what you'd see in a deer or in a cow or in a moose. Okay, different teeth, different guts, doing the same kinds of things with plants. And so you guys as biologists can then take something like this to make some inferences about what we might see in the fossil record. So up there within placental mammals, here's our Laurasia theres. We have our insectivores, our bats, our pangolins, our carnivores. We're not worried about them today. There's one big clade within Laurasia theres that are called the ungulates, these animals that have hooves on their feet. We might ask, both these animals today have this prolonged digestion, especially the cellulose. The bacteria are the only things that can actually digest that cellulose. They have the enzymes to do it, not the animal bacterial community does in their guts. So I'll ask you guys, talk to your neighbors. If you were to put a red tick mark on the phylogeny, where are you gonna put that one or two or three or four, whatever, red tick marks to explain to me the distribution of the prolonged digestion of cellulose? Go ahead and talk to each other about that. Yeah, <laughs> 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 It would surprise me if they started doing like one of those, like, if there was the session state of it, they had to change one of groups. Which is an important question. We can't even answer. Right. It would make sense to me at least. Yes, they'll see if they do it all. All right, so what are. What are some possibilities here for where you guys would put red tick mark S for the inferences again uh, on on this slide? Someone here in the back, what are you guys talking about? Down here. So the common ancestor of both of these organisms inheriting some kind of digestion of cellulose. That's just, that's a great hypothesis. Are there other hypotheses people have? There, I thought it might have evolved twice. Where? Like in both lineages. So one here and one here. Okay. Any other ideas? Do you think it evolved here, but then these both lost it? Just for fun, you could think that. And then you go look for data, and you probably wouldn't find it. But you could still treat it. Be open, have fun, we have hypotheses. So maybe it's a common ancestry thing, maybe they both evolved it independently, okay. What about the teeth? Talk to each other about the teeth. They've got teeth to chew up grass. Why would you put grass grinding molars? Same question, red tick mark, or one, two, three, four, however many more. I mean, the teeth are similar. different, yes. But they are more similar. Like it's still, all right, what are our ideas for this one? That it evolved twice. Twice? So the when you say twice, do you mean where do you mean? Oh, uh, on a on a deer, five and on the zebra. Okay, so 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 maybe each one evolved them on their own. Any other ideas? I got all day. <laughs> 
What is it? It's more than like definition that resembles a around. Sure. But the more specialized, mm -hmm. what you just showed us, right. feels like they would have to each evolve their own version. So you're saying, and this, these seem so complicated, you want to put them as that. So you're saying you like this hypothesis. Another distribution might be just like the other one, right? Ungulates could have inherited some sign of grinding teeth that then became specialized maybe independently. I don't know. So then what are the different kinds of data we can use to get after this? You guys know this. I just showed you that the deer has a certain kind of cellulose digestion, and so does the horse. The deer has a certain kind of molar, and so does the horse. And so you can like add other living organisms to your you know, data collection. And so we can do that. Here's a bunch more things that are on the deer side. Here's one more thing that's on the horse side. These are two of the orders of mammals, artiodactyls, parasodactyls. We're not going to worry about it today, but you guys know this is whales. LOL. Anyway, don't worry about it. <laughs> There's where foregut digestion and selenodont molars go amongst the living organisms. There's where hindgut digestion and lophodont molars specifically, all these things now, go. So go ahead and now talk to each other about the distribution. All four characters, how many red tick marks are you going to put on this phylogeny now to explain this distribution? Talk to your neighbors. Yeah, All right, so any group want to just pick one of these like four specific anatomical things and then tell me how you think you put the red tick mark on the tree? So the lophodont moral order is only pointing at the zebra. Then. Only the zebra on this whole tree has what I would call lophodont teeth. So where would you guys put a red tick mark if you had to for lophodont teeth? <laughs> After the node. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> After that one? Okay. Over here. So maybe only the zebra's got lophodont teeth. Okay, how about hunger digestion? Before, down here for parasodactyls, do we like that? How about these two things, which all three of those animals all have? After the pig. Little pig doesn't have nothing. <laughs> but these three all have foregut digestion and selenodont molars. So this is what's fun, right? You can take the phylogeny of living organisms, look at their adaptation, and come up with these like lines of evidence to explain the distribution of these traits. So when you guys think about the grass grinding teeth of horses and the gut digesting of horses versus the wildebeest that's standing right next to them in Kenya, how would you guys say they have evolved those two traits, grass grinding teeth and fermenting guts? Homologously or convergent? Convergent. Yeah, they both independently adapt to the same ecosystem. And they're both getting eaten by the same crocodile when they try to cross the river. But their ancestors did it in different ways. Different shaped teeth, different part of the soft tissue gut becoming the digestive chamber. To me, that's beautiful and fantastic. They both figured it out fine. They did it in different ways. That's cool. What's really fun, I just asked you this, is that, of course, we can look at fossils, too. The earliest fossils we have of artiodactyls, little guys like Dacodecus, earliest parasodactyls we have good fossils of, animals like Hyracotherium, are small. They've got boring little mammal brachiodont teeth, and they live in the deep forests, those wet forests back in the Eocene. So, of course, the fossils agree with this also. Where does this animal still live? Pretty much in the forest. Where does this one live? Pretty much in the forest. And so these two are showing you a little bit, maybe, 
the more ancient type of parasitactyl and artiodactyl behavioral ecology. But these ones and this one are lineages that went out onto those grasslands once those grasslands showed up. That's super fun and super beautiful to me that we can take modern stuff, use tree thinking, add in the fossils, and we get a very cogent story. Works. It's very fun. So you guys already saw this. This is the Eocene, right? 12 million years after the asteroid impact, lots of mammals diversifying. This is a nice rainforest that's in Wyoming, which is a great sentence. And so there's some of those early artiodactyls, and there's one of these early horses. Their early members are forest adapted. They don't have any of those adaptations. No fancy teeth, no fancy guts, almost certainly. That's really fun. That's really fun. What are some other things that we see when we're out in the grasslands? Well, different animals also doing a lot of convergence in other things besides eating. You guys mentioned the locomotor adaptations. This is cursorial locomotion, animals that are adapted for a running style of locomoting. They're very comfortable at high speeds. They get around that way often. These are animals from different continents. None of these animals are very closely related to each other. Go ahead and talk to each other, please. What are some like anatomical adaptations you can see that are convergently shared by all these cursorial open habitat animals? Talk to each other about that, please. All right, so who can give us some things they're noticing? Your groups are talking about for all these cursorial animals. Long limbs. Long limbs? Anybody want to get more specific with long limbs? I think we probably might all agree with long limbs. What's long about them? Relative to the slender. slender limbs, long limbs. If you are like, we're trying to figure out like which, I mean, these are all, almost all these are mammals, so they don't have any bones you don't have. What part of their legs are long? What part of their arms are long? <laughs> Pretty equal distance, hind leg, foreleg, I would say. I would argue that you would see a, the distal elements of their limbs are very long. They all have very long hands. Here's the ostrich's foot. The ostrich's femur is up here. The zebra's femur is right here. And then this is all foot. This is all foot. This is all foot. That's your heel bone. That's homologous with your heel, right? There's your tibia and fibula. There's your femur. The foot and the finger, the toes or the fingers are really long. Distal elongation, you can see almost all the muscle mass is concentrated way up in the center of the body's gravity. These are distal elements. They're almost all bone and tendon. You don't eat them very much, do you, on these animals? The muscle, the power is kept into this like central portion. And then they have these things that they can send out as far as they can send them. That's really cool. What other things people talking about? I just noticed that uh, all these animals have shoes. What do you mean by shoes? Well, it's either hooves or like leathery foot pads or like really big claws. Yeah, some of have claws. I mean, these, I think the wolf and the cheetah kind of have the, they got those big foot pads. It's true. I'd agree with that. Anybody know what Tamara is? I'm sure you know most of these animals. Anybody know at all what it is at all? Anything? Isn't it a deer in South America? <gasps> Isn't it great? It looks like a deer, doesn't it? This is a rodent. This is a rodent from Patagonia. And so remember, South America gets weird and does a lot of its own stuff. And so these things run. When you see it run, it looks like a little deer, but it's a rodent. And that's convergent evolution. And that's awesome. So, so we got a rodent, artiodactyl, a parasitactyl, a cat, a dog, a cuckoo, and an ostrich. Pretty fun. Here's another parasitactyl just for fun. You can get there. They also are really all fast. They all have the ability to run in a way that could get called a gallop if they have four legs, which means their whole body's off the ground. Even if they weigh hundreds or thousands of pounds, they're like 
off the ground running. That's how fast they are. So I hope you can see here, you know, if you think about a movie that's got like fantasy animals in it, you can make your fantasy animal look like it's like a horse kind of thing real easy, right? By making it have certain proportions, certain adaptations. Oh, Desi, what were you going to say? I was going to say like really long spinal cords. Like I know the cheetah. Oh, uh-huh. Like that to gain. The cheetahs, even amongst these animals, that this cat is a pretty intense specialist. It has, stores a lot of elastic energy in its vertebrae, absolutely, for sure. So these are fun things. But not everything that lives out in the deserts and grasslands is like a big animal or a runner. There's also another kind of adaptation that you can do to locomote very effectively in open habitat. You could be a jumper. Saltatorial animals get around by hopping. Yeah, same question. None of these animals are each other's close relatives. They are all convergently evolved to look like they look. None of them are close relatives. A bunny, a rodent, a rodent, a rodent, a marsupial, and an elephant relative. Okay, talk to each other. Outside of the hair, that's just sitting in the long tail. Yeah, again, outside of the hair. That one's kind of funny. I think it's fair enough. Every other animal just has a lot of balancing tails. And they're all at least got on the gifts. Oh, maybe you know something. Yeah, I can tell you. And they don't do very much of this. They clamber. <laughs> All right, let's hear for some some new people who haven't said anything yet today. What things are you noticing amongst these saltatorial locomotors? Yeah, let's So many of these animals are facultatively, they can be bipedal. Kangaroos are the only ones on here I would say are actually bipedal, like we are and birds are. But like your boas and spring hares. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a spring hare before. It's fantastic. Kangaroo rats, they get down on all fours sometimes. But when they actually need to go somewhere, they're a biped. Long feet, right? Long feet on all of these. This one stays quadrupedal. There's no bipedal buddies. But anyway, I think that's really fun. Again, can I just like, can you just like open your heart for just a quick second and be like marsupial, afrotheer, three different rodents. They all look the same. They're all doing the same thing. Some are huge compared to others in this tire track, but still like, there's a reason this is called a kangaroo crest, right? What, what kind of goes with those hoppy legs, those long feet? Long tail. Yeah, big counterbalancing tails, big old heavy tails. Spring hair is an animal from Slight like, Africa. If you don't know spring hair, Turboas are from Asia. We have kangaroo rats here, which is pretty fun. Any other things people talking about? Huge ears. Huge ears. So a lot of those other animals we're seeing that are cursorial, when they have a predator problem, they book it. And usually they're big enough, they can see really decently in the grassland habitat. These are smaller body animals for the most part. And so they are usually living their lives in the grass. And so for them, they need to be aware because they probably can't see as well as the bigger animals can. And so you have, again, convergently these jagundo ears. It's so fantastic. I love it so much. So let's talk about grasslands and their spread. This is a really complicated figure. I'm gonna break it down a little bit for you. It's from this paper on grassland evolution. And so what you are seeing is time on the left, paleogene, neogene, 60 million, 50 million, 40 million. Got it, I'm sure you do. Don't worry about these dots. This is the temperature curve you've already seen going down that way and up that way. So it's the same curve you've seen, but now it's vertical. I also think you don't have to worry about it right now. 
All these indicators, teeny rectangle, fat rectangle, circle, and then again, repeating pattern, are specific kinds of grass. Grass as a plant goes way back into the Cretaceous. It's just another lineage of flowering plants. But these yellow first open habitat grass, meaning a grass adapted for being out in open area. So grassland adapted grass. First grass at all, we have a fossil that there's at least one. First open habit, grass dominated habitat, meaning like, oh, there's a whole flora that's grassland adapted that goes with that grass. First fauna is where we're seeing animals adapted to live. They have anatomy that shows that they are specialists on that new habitat. Yellow, yellow, yellow. And then red is the exact same thing, but it's for these plants that do a certain kind of photosynthesis, C4 photosynthesis, open your brains from intro bio. I'm not gonna talk about C4, but it's a kind of photosynthesis that's more efficient in arid habitats. Most of the grasses today are C4 photosynthesizers as well as other plants that are C4 photosynthesizers. So this is pretty zoomed in on like plant person. This lady is like the grassland lady, she's awesome. But so this is a lot of information, time on the chart. And then you can see Australia, Africa, South Asia, China, Eurasia, South America, and North America. That's a lot. That's gonna take you a few minutes. Actually, yeah, I'll do that. Put that question up there, interpret this through the neighbors, really try to break it down. This is the literal fossil record of the plants and this grassland in particular. you or they're coming up for you anything at all there's so much here to talk about i have specific questions i'll ask in a second so what's up with the switch from into a c4 dominated grass so c4 is a, uh, a a kind of photosynthesis that is more efficient with like low water conditions and um I don't remember if there's a crazy connection with temperature or not, whether it's like cold or hot grasslands, if that makes a difference, but it's definitely water related. So 
Uh, most grasses, there's plenty of grasses today that aren't C4 photosynthesizers. You guys might be like, what are all these grasses that aren't like grassland grasses? That's like things like bamboo. You know, there's jungle grasses too that are not at all, you know, horse fodder. Um, and so you can see, I mean, how would you guys talk about the distribution of those C4 grasslands, which is what we all are living in right now? That's like what prairies and Serengetis and, you know, Central Asia and all that. That's what that is, is C4 grassland. How is that all distributed in time? Pretty bad. It's fast, maybe. Okay. When in time? Roughly 10 years ago. Yeah, right? Here up in the Neogene, I think you'd all be pretty comfortable saying this is where almost globally we get these evidence of C4 grasslands. There's grasslands before that that are doing the other kind of photosynthesis, the more usual kind of photosynthesis that a lot of other non grass plants are doing. Um, what other patterns are you guys picking up on? Australia stays weird. Australia stays weird. Well, it's still, it's the only one, right? That's still isolated. So it's different. What about the animal relationship with these grasslands? That's what the that's what the fat rectangles are. It's like it started in South America. So uh, I was going to ask you guys that. Isn't it interesting that the people who look really hard all over the world and rocks that are all the same age and all these different ages are like it looks like grassland habitat starts in what's now Patagonia, southern South America. That's really fun and really interesting. And so things you could remember this is the spread of a certain habitat. It'd be interesting to know, and I'm not going to talk about it today because this isn't paleobotany, if like the actual clade spreads all over the world too of those same kinds of grasses. Because remember, climate's a big influencer, right? If it's hot or cold, wet or dry, that's going to be happening and everybody's adapting on different continents. So you could have convergence in the plants too. Yeah. It's a lot more exciting the plants we are like dominating first and then the fauna is like like that's like that, so like how fun is that here's our first central north american habitats for grassland and then it's not for a few more million years before the fossil animals are like have all these adaptations that we can see does it make sense to you that we'd see a delay like there's a new habitat and it takes the animals millions of years for some lineages to be like <laughs> and become grassland animals yeah it's like it's like the diet is dominated first and then the does this make sense to you guys that there's a time delay in a lot of these places? Some this one has a question mark. A time delay in a lot of these places, but then once the plants switch what photosynthesis they're doing, the animals are just right there. What that is, it's a little bit different. This is habit uh oh uh sorry, faunas. Sorry, it's the circles. I think what I said right a minute ago. Uh the the these are like animals adapting to grasslands at all, and then this. We're allowed, we can like look into the enamel of fossil mammal teeth and see what kind of plants they're eating. You can see the C4 diet in a horse today based on the isotopes in its teeth. Doesn't it make sense to you that like a zebra is not interested if you're photosynthesizing this way or this way, it's already adapted to eating grass. So there's not a lot of delay when it comes to the C4 grasslands. It's a new taxonomy of grass. And we're just like, fine, it just keeps eating grass. But the initial evolution, there's a delay where the herbivores come after the actual habitat themselves. I think this is just really fun. This is the kind of big picture stuff I think paleontology is fantastic for and getting your expectations set. One thing I'll tell you about here just for one second, because I think it's amazing. This woman was on my PhD committee. Some of these mammals in South America that adapted to grasslands already had really high crown teeth, probably as an adaptation to all the volcanism that was happening. So there's a lot of ash in that system. So any plant was like covered in grit a lot of the time. So the idea is that some of the South American really early adapters of grasslands were like, I've already been eating volcanic leaves for a long time. So my teeth are already adapted to handle tough garbage. <laughs> it's really fun. Anyway, that's just a little aside. So let's talk about climate, right? You guys have seen this now many times, the last six million years of climate, a little geography in the Paleogene, a little geography in the Neogene, it's getting a little cold, Antarctica is getting glaciated. And so you can see there is a step change. And then as we get into that 10 million year range, an even farther step change, and now drop, an increasing chill and an increasing drying out of the Earth's climates. That is gonna be what is driving the spread of these plants that are just adapted to live in habitats like that. The Earth's climate system is allowing grasslands to spread, and so then they do. And so you guys have seen this. This is our summary slide. I'll be adding some emojis to it now. 
There's early grass relatives back in the Cretaceous. There's kinds of grass in the Cretaceous, like bamboo, jungly kind of grass. But we start to see, at least in South America, grasslands and grassland adapted animals about 40 some million years ago. As you move into the Oligocene, more places, parts of Asia, parts of North America, get a little bit of grassland. But it's not until there's that South American context for you guys again. These arid areas, and this is the one where it looks like that biome first evolves. Then we go into the Neogene, grasslands go buck wild. And you guys saw that once you get to about 10 million years ago, almost every continent has these huge swaths of its territory that are covered in grassland. Here, all of here, there. It's very cool. And on the different continents, different animals do the same kinds of adaptations to move into those continents. So let's just show you some fun animals. <laughs> So this is one of these famous Smithsonian murals. You guys saw the one from the Eocene from you know, 12 million years after the asteroid impact. This is part of a series that this one artist did. You can see them if you go to DC today. I love these murals. Uh, they are so full of cool stuff. This is Nebraska in the very early stages of North American grasslands. So these are not C4 grasses, they're C3 grasses. These are these pioneering animals, some of the first waves to go out onto the grasslands. I love fossil mammals for the thing that I said earlier. You guys probably recognize them. Other ones you probably don't. So I just want you to enjoy this. Talk to your neighbors. Who's who? Who you have no idea what it is? Have fun. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, right behind them, them and a couple other stories that they find these, like how it's done. If you crash that, you're going to play on this mountain. We just look like four minutes. I think it out here. But I think that one is the first one. It's kind of small, but I don't know exactly. The big, scary one, I'm pretty sure that's the gas that works out. The engine car. It's kind of like a big one. It's kind of like a big one. All right, who feels like really confident they I know what that one is? A parasite, there's so many parasitacles. You want to tell us one of these? Uh, the one right in the Right here? What kind of parasitacle do you think it is? Yeah, but you just had to say. It certainly is a really horse. It's a real horse relative. I think those are pretty horsey. They're only this tall, but like still nice and horsey. Uh, what else? Groundhogs. Groundhogs. It is little rodents here. They have horns, which is really fun. Uh, there's really beautiful fossils of their burrows. Their, their burrows are uh, like DNA structure, like spirals. They all live down there. Pretty fun. So you have rodents adapting to these grasslands too. So we have horses, we got rodents. What else? Clawed camels. Where's the clawed camel? Side. Oh, this thing? Yeah. Do we love this? No. I do. This is yeah. one of my favorite. <laughs> this is one of my like I dream of genie like the extinction wishes. So that's a calicathere. Those are horse relatives. So these are the these are a kind of animal that are close relatives to horses. They evolved in the forests. They're basically sloths on the northern continents, but they're horses. And some of them become grassland adjacent. And actually, early human evolution, there's a couple species of calicatheres like in Kenya, like alongside early little people, which is really fun. So this is an extinct uh, horse relative, another parasitactyl. I love it. What else? Uh, a hell pig. A hell pig? What's a hell pig? The giant pig thing. Everybody agree what they think he's talking about? Yes. Okay, good. This thing, giant hell pig, that's called an intelodont. 
Um, they are interesting. They're almost certainly omnivores and maybe even sometimes are carnivores. Uh, good evidence for them. They live in Asia and North America. The biggest of these helpates, like their shoulders are like this. So they're very big predators, like seven foot at the shoulder uh, when they are predators, which is pretty unsettling. They're called help eggs because they certainly look piggish. Uh, they are not at all actually thought to be close relatives of pigs. They are almost certainly on the whipomorph stem. So whales and hippos being some of their living relatives, which you can again, enjoy for yourself. We got some rhinos up here, nice delicate rhino, a lot of camels all over the place. Nobody saying anything about this guy with the weird face. That's okay, you don't have to. And then these things and these things are also relatives of like artiodactyls. They're part of this group called oreodonts, oreo teeth. I'm not gonna worry about it. They sometimes are thought, thought to be camel relatives, but oftentimes today people don't think of them like that. And then these are interesting animals. They're called bear dogs. They're part of the carnivora and they are really close to, this is before dogs and bears had split from each other. And the whole dog side of carnivora is really radiated. So these are interesting, like mixed bags. All right, so that's Nebraska 23 million years ago, the early stages of grassland evolution on this continent, North America. Camel evolution, horse evolution, most of rhino evolution happens on this continent, which is really fun because you guys don't live in a world where we have tons of camels and horses and rhinos wild everywhere, but they do evolve on this continent for the most part. Okay, here's 10 million years later, about 10 million years ago, still in Nebraska. Chat with each other. <laughs> Who's in Nebraska now? Some writers have become a lot less yeah. delicate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's undoubtedly. Or was it like her? Yeah. <laughs> All right, same question. Who's like, I know what that is. Yeah. Camel, where, which one? <laughs> so there's some camels up here. Here's a real old big camel back there. Any other camels? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, no, this one's a camel, a little one. We have camels like this from Idaho. If you guys come to the museum, you'll see that skull Elmer. We have these camels that are like eight, nine feet tall at the shoulder. Um, I'm not showing it to you on this slide. We jumped it in time, but there's a lineage of camels that only in North America evolves really long necks. And they're basically giraffes. Giraffes never come to this continent. Camels just do what giraffes do for a while in the Neogene on this continent only, which is really fun. All right, what else? There's the Synthesaurus. A weird horn ear thing. So this slingshot nose right here, it's called synthetoceras, fake horn, right? Synthetic horn, because they didn't really believe it. We have a synthetoceras skull on display at the museum. If you guys come to the museum, look for it. So this is not an antler and it's not a horn. It's bone of the skull that's covered in fur. Uh, just like a lot of animals do have today, like giraffes have what we call ossicones. They don't have like a horn or an antler, right? But they have those knobs that have hair on them. These animals have that. These animals have that. This is one of my favorites, Craniosaurus. It looks totally normal. Two big horns, two ears. But then the back of their skull, they have a midline horn that's even longer than the others. It just goes straight back. Super awesome. Super awesome. Herd behavior, different types of sexual selection. Males walking around, fighting each other. If you're a lady, you get to see all of them at once. You're not in some jungle and like he's doing his dance for you. You can watch all the dudes all lined up. So some of these dudes start to get real showy and real fun. Sexual selection amongst animals in these herding groups happens a lot. 
That's cool. What else? There's elephants and rhinos in the lot. Elephants. So you guys know, right? 23 million years ago, the last one I showed you, Africa was still not quite connected. And so by now, it's been 13 million more years. Africa has hit Eurasia, elephants have come out, now there's elephants in North America too. The elephants that are here at this time are those weird gomphotheres with the shovel mouths. There are almost, uh, at this time, they're starting to be mastodons, maybe, in North America. There's still no true elephants, there's definitely no mammoths or anything like that. We're too old for that. So the elephants we have are these big shovel tusk, shovel, shovel face gomphotheres. There's big old rhinos, this is one of my favorites, it's called Telosaurus, it's like the hippo rhino. It's very fat, it has very short legs. So it's thought to have like a hippo ecology. And there's a room at the museum in Nebraska, if you guys ever go to that museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, where they've got like hundreds of skulls of Telosaurus because they have so many from Nebraska. <laughs> so, okay, we got pronghorn relatives. We've got pecorary pig relatives. Horses, 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 for sure. Um, there is a carnivorous a cat right here, which is pretty cool. There's one of those bear dogs, another one, late living, amphicyonid. These are also true dogs, but they're called borophagine dogs. They are convergently doing what hyenas are doing over in Eurasia and Africa. Hyenas never come to our continent. There's a lineage of dogs that becomes bone crushing predators on this continent. So our giraffes are really camels and our hyenas are really dogs, but the same ecologies are evolving. I love it. <laughs> so just to show you some more from that Nebraska stuff, this is something you guys saw on one of my first lectures when we talked about how fossils are formed. I told you about sometimes you get these lager stones. Fossils are buried really quickly. You guys being Idaho people, I think would care about this. 11 million years ago or so was one of the times the Yellowstone hotspot erupted and covered a lot of North America in ash. So all of these animals that you can find in Nebraska are animals that were around a watering hole when that ash cloud from Yellowstone buried them alive. And so they're all arranged as they were when they got buried in that hot ash. So this is one of those rhinos. This is a Telosaurus, dead at the side of the watering hole, perfect every bone from Nebraska. And so there's all the rhinos that you can get in that same barn. It's a state park in Nebraska. If you're ever driving there, I say go to it. It's super cool. Rhinos, horses, gomphotheres, really fun water birds like cranes, there's giant tortoises. All these animals that are part of this landscape are all buried together. And so I showed you that. Here's like a nice diagram they show of that if you go to their uh, exhibits. And so you guys just saw these animals. It's a little bit older than what I just showed you, but some horses, some camels, some tortoises. There's all these wallowing rhinos. There's those gomphotheres fighting off the hyena dogs. And then there's that camel that's really doing a giraffe thing, which is super fun. And also some other horses. Also, all these horses have like a couple of hooves. They're not like our horses. They're not down to one hoof quite yet. That comes later. And so isn't it interesting that like, there's all these different orders of placental mammals and many, many, many of them, but not all of them, have members that are adapted to these like semi-arid to arid grassland ecosystems. And so just for you, I'm replacing, I'm making this more digestible. Isn't it fun that I can do this and it doesn't change anything? I think that's good. <laughs> so just to give you a little bit of context, here's like the diversity of parasidactyls and artiodactyls we've been talking about with other Laurasia theories. I'm just gonna throw up here animals that we've talked about already. We talked in the island continents about creodonts and notoungulates in South America. I'm just giving you a little taste if you care when you look at the slides and go back and see where stuff goes. Uh, but now let's talk about some of the specifics in here. There's so many cool stories, animals I really wanna show you guys. We did this on Tuesday. Do you love that that's in there? I think it's so good. So where do some of these fossil lineages go that we talked about? Well, let's talk about them. So this is a really important group of mostly North American, but then they spread into Asia. Uh, early giant herbivores among the mammals. One of them is in that Eocene bureau you've seen. These are called brontotheres. Uh, I've been blabbing for a second. Talk to your neighbors about brontotheres. This is just gonna be fun diversity for a minute here and showing you cool fossils. How great is this fossil? Okay, anyway, tell me about brontotheres. What are you noticing? Yeah. 
almost certainly, yeah. Being paleo artists really pulling it right out of the Yeah. Which makes sense. Yeah. 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 Right. No, that's so yeah. 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 It looks like a So one thing I think I think you guys are talking about. I mean, I'm you know I'm eavesdropping. You're talking about you know people use rhinos as an inspiration, but these things are not rhinos. They do not have skulls like rhinos have at all. A rhino has a nice big nose, sure. But the whole horn structure of a rhino is made out of keratin, like it's derived from hair. It's a dermal structure. It's loose. You can take a horn away from a skull. These animals, this is a projection of their skull. And in some of them, it's actually very delicate and thin. If you like pinch the bone, you can your fingers feel very much like they're going to touch. It's really delicate. So they're definitely not like doing a bunch of head ramming. And so is this all display? How great is that if it's display? I wrote it here in the text, but there's this paper that came out four or five years ago that everybody was like, what? And people are talking about nostril position amongst a lot of the different animals we have today. And people are like, you actually don't know if their nostrils are here or like anywhere up along. So sometimes you get these <laughs> reconstructions and then it becomes like, oh my gosh, if that bone is really delicate, there's a, I don't know if you guys have ever seen like how some seals do things, but could they like be like, like inflate something? Could they show off somehow? We don't have their soft tissue. And these things have never really quite made sense other ways. So maybe there is some sort of resonant chamber up there, some display structure. I don't know. They have absolutely hilarious teeth. Like their teeth are bigger than my fist. Like each molar is huge. And you're like, all right, I get it. You eat plants. You're so cool. But you can see these animals lived in North America. They lived in Asia before those habitats had the true grasslands. We find them in deserts. We find them in mixed forests, but not grasslands because grasslands weren't around when they were around. I also think it's really incredible that these animals look like what they look like. And based on their anatomy, just like those calicopiers, the sloth things, are actually probably forced relatives, not with rhinos or tapers. We do think they're parasodactyls, pretty much completely, but probably on the horse side of things within parasodactyls. That's really fun. Now let's talk about other cool things. Maybe some of the greatest animals ever. Uh, amongst, though, it might not be the technically actually heaviest, but amongst the biggest land mammals of all time are these indricotheres. Here's a nice Indricotherium skeleton on display in a museum. You can see the people looking at it. Uh, talk to your neighbors for just a quick second about these Indricotheres. What questions do you have? Aren't these wonderful organisms? Hornless rhinoceroses that are as tall as giraffes, but they're not long-necked, really. There was a display one time that people set up in Europe where they had one of these mounted and they just had giraffe skeletons next to it. And the giraffes and the rhinos are like looking each other in the eye. The giraffes, this like twig looking thing next to this giant rhinoceros. It's, it's tall, it's back, it's shoulders, it's butt, or as tall as the giraffe's head. And it's a rhino. How great are these things? They're almost all from Central Asia, Mongolia, and then even farther in, a lot of the stands have some. That's one of our biggest rhinos today, the Asian rhinoceros. So that's to scale, <laughs> just to make it really clear. These are animals I think should get more public press than they do get because they're so fantastic. 
Uh, they might not be, they're relatively delicate, long limbs and stuff like that. They might not be the heaviest land mammals of all time. There's two elephants that are like really, really huge. But like, they are definitely up there. If you guys go back to our sauropod lectures, long neck dinosaur lectures, there's one of these on that scale with like the ichthyosaur and the T-Rex and stuff, because like people want to know how big are endricotheres next to sauropods. And it's like, well, they don't look big next to sauropods, but they are hilarious. What is the reproductive biology like of this animal? Yeah. How long is this animal pregnant to make this baby that's like as big as one of these? <laughs> really cool, huh? I like that they're hornless. I like rhinos without horns. I think that's cool too. Anybody else have anything they want to say about this? One of the things that I think is really interesting that you kind of mentioned is how um, how much skinnier yeah. uh, the hind limbs bones are. Oh, sure. Like, you know, you can tell that the mass is mm -hmm. a lot more weighty, but on the forelimbs. Yes, I think that's true. And they're so tall. They're so weird. They're so weird. The, if you go to New York City, you can see uh, they have a big wire mount to the American Museum of like the full body of one of these. And then they have one of the skulls. This is the skull that's in New York City, like on display up there. But it's just kind of a floating skull. I've only seen one of these put together in Moscow and Russia. And it is like truly upsetting because it's like just as big as the dinosaurs that were in the room you just left. But it's a rhino. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking like reproduction where it's like bigger than a giraffe. Not only like height, but like mass wise. Wave, like many, many giraffes wave. Yeah, yeah, right. Would they give birth standing up like giraffes? Or would they have to do it like that? Great. Most animals today that are big, open, have to animals don't do too much laying down. They just kind of have their babies. Um, baby elephants, if you've ever seen footage of a baby elephant being born, sometimes they just like fall down a hill a little bit and then the mom <laughs> has to go get them. Uh, if you don't know it, there is a series that the BBC made called Walking with Beasts that's like supposed to show you all the Cenozoic. And one of the episodes of that series is 100% about a mother giving birth to a baby in Drinketheer, like the first day and a half of that baby's life. It's like cool predators come, hell pigs come. If you want to see these animals walking around and flapping their ears, there's a show from like 2004 you can watch if you want to. Here's those calicotheres, the horse sloths. So these are animals that are related to horses, also parasodactyls. The brontotheres, the endricotheres, and the calicotheres, everything I've shown you so far is a parasodactyl, an odd hoof ungulate related to horses or to rhinos. Tapers are in there too, of course. And so calicotheres are really, really compelling to me because they're showing you that experimentation. In Australia, there's really big kangaroos that like eat like this. In South America, there's really big sloths that eat like this. And in Eurasia and North America, there's horses, I guess, that sit on their butts and go like this, called calicotheres. Really fun. These are like ground sloths, but they're not xenarthrids. They are parasodactyls. It's extremely cool. There's a nice fossil behind them of a rhino and a compotheer behind this calicotheer that they have going up this tree. It's got little hoofy claws. It's so great. I won't make you talk about every single slide because I have so many fun things, but these are the animals that like, you walk by them in a museum and your brow kind of froze if you're paying attention and you're like, I don't know what to do with this and you keep walking. Because over there's a mammoth and right there was a T-Rex and you know what those are already. And these are always in the middle and definitely deserve like a little bit of your attention biologically because it's like, what an amazing pattern of a mammalian ecology. You guys saw dinosaurs, those therizinosaurs that probably did the exact same thing, sit on their butts and have big long claws and bring vegetation to their mouths. This is a fun ecology. I want to be a little bit aware of time. Yeah, okay, yeah. So here's where those would go on our modern phylogeny of vertebrates. The endricotheres are rhinos, the brontotheres and the calicotheres are on the horse side. But look at all these groups you've met that are parasodactyls or relatives of parasodactyls. Today, there's only a handful of species of rhinos, horses, and tapers. And there's many, 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 many species of artiodactyls on the planet right now. So there's a bit of a mismatch. And back in the Paleocene, we see like the opposite. There's way a lot of parasodactyls everywhere and artiodactyls are kind of small and rare. But that doesn't mean there's not awesome artiodactyls. Don't you worry. <laughs> so here are those help pigs, intelodonts. Um, you saw them in the diagram just now. They go for quite a while into the Neogene. They live in those early glass grasslands and deserts in Eurasia and in North America. This is one of the big ones, Deodon. Would you like to meet this predator? If it is a predator, which we think it probably is a predator. That's great, right? I don't even have anything to tell you. So I want you to look at it and accept it. One of the only fossils I personally have ever found from the Oligocene was one of these cheekbones. 
I like found it and was like, is this Intelligence Jugal? And the people I was with who know about mammals were like, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, great. But anyway, weird animals. And again, not actually related to pigs. We'll talk about them. Here's those protoceratids. These are animals you saw. You saw that Syntheticeris. You can go see this at the museum right now down campus, but there's many other kinds with interesting tusks, saber teeth, and these early artiodactyls all over the place. And again, this is bony expansions of their skull. This isn't the antlers or horns that later artiodactyls are going to have. These are covered with some sort of dermal covering. Probably they're just furry. But this is the bones of this animal's skull, like ridges and bumps on it. This slingshot, how could that be anything other than sexually selected ornamentation? What could you possibly be doing otherwise with something like this on your nose? Also, that's a pretty gnarly like face itself with that nose down there. So a lot of these animals are known best from North America, although they do spread over to uh, Eurasia too. Um, really interesting. And you can see they don't just like show up and go away. They go really close. So you get animals that are familiar to you, antelope things, bovidy, cow -y kind of things, camels, of course. And these things are still around. They're still part of the habitat. Um, if you made me study mammals and I was only allowed to study mammals, I might become the giraffe guy because they freak me out and I love them so much. There's a clade today, the pronghorn all by itself, the only living species, and then the handful of giraffe species that are alive on this planet right now are sister to each other. And there's a huge amount of fossils. Again, they spread down into Africa, but mostly North America. And in fact, for, actually not North America, mostly Eur uh, Eurasia for these. Some of the pronghorns are in North America. This is a crazy group of animals. Again, not horns, not antlers, cranial bone evolving as ornamentation. Actually, take a quick second and like try to make sense of what I'm showing you here, like these images. Just do that real quick. Talk to each other about these animals. All right, I'll, I'll pull you guys back in. Obviously, there's a bunch of awesome headgear here. Uh, this is one of my favorites, Prolibitherium. This is what you find sometimes, and then this is what you find sometimes. So the horny, bony points are obviously first, and then a really thin sheet of bone grows out and connects them to make this big structure. We don't, I don't know, I'm ignorant. I'm saying I don't know, I'm sure the people who study them know. If this is a male-female thing, or if this is just like a younger male and an older male. But again, it's not antlers. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bone of the skull going like this. This is what horned dinosaurs do. This is what Triceratops does. Big bony displays and big horns, but it's on a mammal. And so these are some of these early relatives that are maybe close to giraffes. Some of them are actually like tetrameric, so almost certainly a pronghorn. So not a giraffe, a pronghorn side of things. But I need to show you, this is where we'll stop. These are my favorite, favorite, favorite. These are the actual true giraffe relatives that are extinct. The modern clade of giraffes, you guys probably think about giraffes. But there's also okapis that are alive right now. And okapis do a lot of hard work. They live in the Congo, deep in the rainforest. Okapis show us what giraffes were like most of the time before one lineage adapted to be open grassland browsers and got super, super, super long necks. Many of the fossil giraffes that are known look like moose, but they're not. They're giraffes. Those are bones of the skull. And so here's Brahmatherium from India. Look how massive those structures are on its forehead. Shantotherium's Chinese. Sevatherium's also from India. Look at this nose. Look at these. Look at this swoop. The first time I saw a C I think this is why I like them so much. The first time I saw a Sevatherium skull, there was a piece of like plastic draped over it. And I thought there was a Triceratops or something underneath. And then the curator's like, oh no, no, that's Sevatherium. And ripped it back and I was like, I'd never heard of it before. And he's like, it's a giraffe. I'm like, what? <laughs> That is awesome. This is a huge animal. You're like this tall. 
on this jig moose animal. And so one lineage has these amazingly interesting necks. Most of them don't. Most of them kind of look like the Zocopi, but way, way bigger. So these awesome, awesome mooses that are not mooses because mooses are deer. These are giraffes. And they show you the true nature of this animal, which is very fantastic in its own right. And then, well, there's why I'll leave you here with the already natural phylogeny. There's where hell pigs go and some of those giraffoids and stem giraffes. And so look at all this crazy stuff that's happening in here. Really, really, really fun. And we'll worry about temperatures and other stuff later. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs>